Good morning, y'all, and welcome to worship at Redeemer Church this morning. Uh, We are glad you are here and here to worship our God. We have a few announcements. One is we are thinking we'll probably only have one service again next week at 11 a.m., but email will go out uh, to register for that. Uh, So keep an eye out for that. Also, this is the last week for tithing for 2020 for tax purposes, so if anyone is thinking about that uh, for the next year, please make sure that comes into the church uh, this week. And I believe that is all. Let's take a few moments and prepare our hearts to worship our God. Well, our God has called us to his worship this morning from Psalm 111. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright and the congregation, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, you are the source of all good things. Father, you are... Love, righteousness, justice, peace, and wisdom. Father, we plead for these things uh, this morning as we worship you, as we work to love you and our neighbor. Father, we pray that you would uh, give us wisdom in all the decisions that we have to make. Father, we pray that you would be glorified in all the attributes that you have uh, this morning in our worship. In your name we pray. Amen. Please take your worship bulletins and stand and sing. Uh, We will sing We Three Kings together. We three kings of glory and tar, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder. Consider this morning wisdom 
and the story of the three wise men, a true story, uh, of those who came and sought uh, the child, the Christ child. They were seeking after a star, seeking after light. And I think we must acknowledge that in us, there is much darkness. Uh, and so we need the light. We need the light of Christ. We need the light of him who died for our sins, the darkness that is in us, and gave us light and love and righteousness. So let us pray together and confess our sins together and confess our own darkness before our God. Please pray with me the corporate confession of sin printed in our bulletin. Lord, we confess that we deeply lack wisdom. We have not feared you, but instead have feared people and circumstances, giving the reverence and awe to the created order that belongs to you as our creator. We have rejected your perfect wisdom revealed in your word, preferring to trust the wisdom of this world instead. We have sought to define ourselves what is good and what is evil in all our relationships, our speech, our work, and in all we do. Father, forgive us, we pray. Take a few moments to confess your sins of this week before our God. Our God does not leave us in our sin, but he gives us light and wisdom and grace. Please hear that from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of wisdom of righteousness and peace and justice and glory. Father, we plead this morning particularly for wisdom. Father, at this time when we have to make so many decisions about what to do about the pandemic, about our relationships, about our jobs, about our families, Father, we plead for that, that we would make wise decisions before you and before a watching world. Father, we pray that you would strengthen us to make decisions that show your love, that would reflect our love for you and for our neighbor. Father, we plead for continued wisdom and your providence as we consider a major decision before our church about the possibility of purchasing this building. Father, whether we should be here, whether we should be somewhere else, whether we should continue to try to do online, uh, meet in person for worship, Father, we pray that you would give us wisdom and a desire to how to minister to each other uh, during this pandemic. Father, please help us. Please be with us that we may strengthen our brothers and sisters. Father, we pray for those who are struggling with depression or sorrow or grief during the holiday season. Father, please be with us. Father, all of us do in some way, I'm sure. Help us and be with us and strengthen us and remind us that you are our God and our great Heavenly Father and our great love. Father, we pray that you would be with those who are sick. Father, please be with those who are helping them in the medical industry, our doctors, our nurses, our EMTs, all those who care for them. Father, we pray that you would grant deliverance from this virus. Father, as long as you let it remain, Please help us to see what you would teach us and have us learn and grow from it. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we continue your worship this morning. May it be an honor and glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. 
Once again, welcome to Redeemer. I invite you to grab a Bible or follow along in the bulletin if you would like. Matthew 2. I had a good friend down in Redeemer South who got very frustrated with people and their little nativity sets, having the wise men next to baby Jesus because he would always say, Pastor, don't people know that the wise men weren't actually there the night of? So we are not a year and a half after the birth of Christ. We're two days after Christmas, so it felt appropriate to look at the wise men. But let's hear from God's word, beginning in Matthew 2, verse 1, a familiar text. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We acknowledge the truth that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but not so the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord abides forever. Give us ears to hear what you have to say in Christ's name. Amen. As a young boy, I remember my brother, who's a couple of years older than me, were called into the kitchen on one particular day, and there was a map and a bunch of notes and kind of clues left for us by my dad. And basically, he had gotten a bunch of little small trinkets and candy and stuff and hidden it in the yard, and it was our job to go find the treasure, to use that language, if you will. So we were very intentional with reading those clues. We reread them wanted to make sure we knew exactly where we were going. In perfect honesty, my brother is the older and wiser one of the two, so I was just kind of tag along, yeah, whatever you say. Uh, So we were very intentional, but we were also very committed. It took a long time. It wasn't just go out in the yard and, you know, there it is. We had to go 20 steps this way, 30 steps back. My dad was a real kind of sneaker that way. Why couldn't he just say it's right there? Uh, But a part of that also was we needed help. And so there was times where we would go to my dad and say, we don't get it. We've read it. We, we've read it, but we still need help. We don't understand what's going on. Can you help us? And it got to the point, it was pretty comical with, um, why don't you look at that tree right there, right there in the fork, right behind it, and then, of course, we would find, find the goodies, if you will. I mentioned that because many, many years ago, uh, these men from the East went on their own treasure hunt, to use that language. They, of course, were not searching for toys or candy, uh, but rather a person. A particular person, the Christ child. Uh, they are commonly called the wise men, but here's the question. What made them wise? Was it their superior knowledge? You know, would these guys be like, would they excel on Jeopardy or something? Was it their love for study, uh, their devotion to study? I think it was actually something else. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said this, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There's no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. Um, I'll read that one more time slowly because that sounds like a Dr. Seuss line, doesn't it? There's no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. These wise men were wise, but they knew how to use the knowledge that was given to them. That, I think, is what made them wise. But, But what about us? You know, like the wise men, we probably have knowledge about some things. We might even have knowledge about a great deal of things or a certain subject matter. But even though we have that knowledge, let's ask and answer this question honestly, each of us. 
how often do we struggle with making foolish decisions that bring harm to ourselves or those that we love dearly? How often do we struggle with making choices that clearly go against what we claim to know and claim to believe in? You know, as this year closes, we don't simply need knowledge. Uh, we need wisdom. We need Jesus, obviously. And so uh, this morning for a few minutes, let's see what kind of made these wise men so wise as well as the impact these truths have for you and I. So really just two points and some application this morning. First, uh, the wise men sought Jesus. That's what or who they went after. Um, we see that in verse 1. But what does it mean to truly seek for something or someone? What does that look like, practically speaking? Like, how do you know that you're doing that, that you're seeking for something or someone? I want to suggest three things from the text. Uh, First is this, to seek something is to be intentionally looking for something or, again, uh, someone. They were looking for Jesus. Verse 1 tells us they came to Jerusalem from the east. That was their destination. They didn't necessarily know Jerusalem was the destination. They were following this star, as the text tells us. Um, But who were these guys? Earlier times, wise men referred to priests and experts in in mysteries like in Persia and Babylon. By the time of Christ's birth, though, uh, this probably referred in a more wide range, kind of like people who practiced in astrology or dream interpretation, uh, kind of the pursuit of magic or wisdom, if you will. Uh, But these were learned men who were familiar not just with the Old Testament scripture, but with lots of ancient Eastern writings. They probably came in contact with the scriptures, uh, assuming they were from Persia, of course. Uh, Remember, we just got done studying Esther uh, a few weeks or months ago, and we saw in the book of Esther that the Jews had been uh, basically intermingling with the Persians for a while. And so the point is there's kind of two cultures kind of clashing, if you will. And so more than likely, they probably threw some Jewish friends and writing picked up on the Old Testament prophecies there. This would certainly explain how they quoted Micah in, I think it's verse 6 to Herod, uh, verse 5-2. They also might have been referring to a prophecy from Balaam in Numbers 24. He said, a star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter that will rise out of Israel. The Jews, of course, understood this to point to the messianic deliverer that they were longing for. Um, These wise men probably, uh, I would think, honed in on this particular verse because of the word star. It probably caught their attention because they were astrologers. They were star gazers, if you will. Quick side note, the Bible forbids astrology. Jeremiah once wrote, Do not be terrified by signs in the sky, though the nations are terrified by them. And then Isaiah would actually go on to to write. He actually mocked some people. He mocked, quote, Stargazers who make predictions month by month, uh, but can't save themselves. Uh, most of you probably know that uh, the family and I lived in Tampa Bay for about 13 years, and that's a pretty interesting city. And in that city, there are a lot of um, fortune tellers or people who it, they will take your money and tell you who you're going to marry or when you're going to get married or what job you should take or why. But what always stood out to me, not that I physically went to these places, but just driving by, I always thought to myself, okay, if these folks know the future so well, um, at the risk of sounding judgmental, wouldn't they be living in a little bit better place? Uh, Wouldn't they, uh, it just feels like there's something off, if you uh, will. And that's what you hear in Isaiah, kind of mocking any human who would dare say, I know what the future holds. Only God alone knows that, obviously. Um, I like what one commentator said about this. Um, God's not endorsing astrology, but he does choose to speak to stargazers through a star. In other words, he's speaking their language. This is the language that they understood. And so uh, he's speaking that. And interestingly, I don't know if you caught it, but verse 9, Matthew tells us that the star actually moved. It, it moved until it landed on the place, the home, where Jesus was residing. Uh, This movement suggests, obviously, that this was not a natural phenomenon. It wasn't a supernova or conjunction of planets. You know, it wasn't a comet. It was rather something supernatural. I don't know exactly what it was. Maybe it was an angel who kind of looked like a star. Or uh, maybe it was some kind of created heavenly phenomenon. Or, quite honestly, it could have been a star that physically moved because God is God and obviously can do whatever he wishes to do. The point is, these men were very intentional about seeking the Christ child. Second thing we see about seeking is that to seek something is not only to be intentional, but it's to be committed. Um, takes time. 
perseverance, in other words. We don't know how long the wise men were searching uh, for Jesus. We don't know when they came across Micah, the prophecy, or other Old Testament uh, prophecies. But we do know that they took this seriously, and they kept watching the sky for a sign, which turned out to be uh, a star. Most likely would have required even years of searching on their part. Context clues in the narrative also teach us that uh, the wise men took considerable time to make this trip. Uh, More than likely, again, context clues teach us that there was a large number of attendants, uh, probably some bodyguards as well, uh, with them on the long journey. And this journey could have taken up to several weeks. We don't know the route that they went, but if they went the main trade route from Babylon to Jerusalem, that's about an 800-mile journey. So if they're averaging 20 miles a day, then you're looking at 40 weeks, you know, a little over a month to get there. The point is, it was a long trip. It was a costly trip. And it points to this truth that when we are truly seeking something that we think we want or need, we're committed, aren't we? We, we put that time into it. Uh, it just kind of uh, happens naturally, if you will. And then lastly, to seek for something, it's to ask for help. This part always cracks me up in my opinion look at verse one these magi get to jerusalem what's the first thing they do where's the christ child in other words they ask for directions ladies you heard that correctly men actually stopped and asked where do i go i need some help Um, i need to read and reread this Um, my wife says yes you need to ask for help Um, but they asked for help why well because number one they needed it but number two Finding the Christ child was important for them. And this was the time to put pride aside and say, hey, I need a little help. We needed to ask my dad when we were doing that treasure hunt. We need some help. We don't know what to do. Uh, Years ago, our oldest son, we kind of stumbled upon the fact that he's got all sorts of allergy issues uh, going on. And so when we went through that time period with him, uh, we were very intentional in our conversations with people. Uh, God brought many wonderful people in our lives, some through the church, some through neighbors, uh, some just strangers who learned what was going on. Uh, But we were very intentional in our conversations. Hey, what do we do? What's worked for you? Um, Any recommendations, things like that. We certainly were committed for the long haul. Uh, We had to change, obviously, his diet. We had to change food that we buy or don't buy and have in the house. Um, And then, of course, um, we needed help at times. We went to doctors. We went to others to do that. And we did that because, obviously, our son's important to us. Uh, His health is important. Um, But we see this over and over. To seek for something really means that you're intentional. You know, it means you sometimes ask for help, that you're committed for the long haul. So here's the question to ask yourself this morning. What about you? You know, what are you seeking for? Everybody is searching for something in life. Most people, or I shouldn't say most, many people may not know what they're searching for, but many people are searching for something or someone. The question is what? Are we searching for God's glory or our own? Are we seeking comfortable living or kingdom life, kingdom advancement? Uh, If we are seeking comfortable lifestyle, then we'll be satisfied with just kind of coming to church, maybe reading our Bibles, maybe trying to do some good things here and there, Um, kingdom advancement would look much different. Kingdom advancement is, you know what, I'm going to go talk to my neighbor. I don't want to talk to my neighbor because I know that he or she is going through a divorce, and I have no idea what to say to this person, and it's awkward, and it feels weird, but I'm committed to a kingdom advancement. So I'm going to go say, hey, how's it going? I've been praying for you. Do you need anything? You know, how how are things going? If you want to know what you're seeking, here's a couple of questions that we can ask ourselves uh, on a daily basis. What are you intentional about in your life? Like when you wake up, what is, this has got to get done. This is important. I'm going to be very intentional with doing fill in the blank. Whatever that is, there's a large probability that that is something that is deeply important to you personally and that you're seeking. Or ask yourself this, what are you committed for to working very hard for the long haul? Could be your marriage, could be your children, could be a career, could be a particular branch of study in school, but what are you committed for the long haul? Or uh, what we need to ask ourselves is, what is so important to us in our lives that we will actually die to our pride and say, I need help. I'm trying to do this, but I can't do it. Can you please help me? Again, that's a good indication of something that's important to us. Uh, The wise men sought Jesus, but that wasn't enough, which brings me just quickly to the second point. The wise men not only sought Jesus, but they worshipped Jesus. If you look in the scripture, you'll see the word worship three times in this text. Verse 2, verse 8, and verse 11. 
And before we look at really what it looks like to worship, just a quick um, understanding of this word. In fairness, this word here most likely doesn't mean worship the way we probably think worship, uh, like coming corporately to worship, praising and worshiping God in that context. It most likely means to express respect or to pay homage to a superior rank. Remember, these men were uh, Eastern in origin, and so they were accustomed to coming to someone of importance, putting their knees on the ground, and then touching their head with the ground, um, their forehead. Again, think about Esther. You might remember Haman. Haman was infuriated because Mordecai refused to do this very thing. This is what the men uh, were doing. Um, It's also worth noting that these uh, quasi-pagan religious men, to use this, probably did not understand Jesus' divine nature. Um, just because they bow down in reverence did not mean that they knew everything about him, meaning that they knew, hey, this is actually God. This is the second person of the Trinity who will die for his people's sin. And I'm certainly not saying that God did not save these men, and I'm not saying that he didn't save them at this time. I'm just saying that this particular word doesn't necessarily mean worship uh, the way we might understand today. But their actions were certainly appropriate, and it wonderfully foreshadows the truth that Gentiles will worship Jesus even in the future. There's a whole room for them right now, and there may be some Jewish people among us too. I don't know. But what we see first in worship is true worship employs humility. These men bowed down. These men were not the most important men in the world, but they were important. These men weren't the richest men in the world, but they obviously had considerable resources to be able to go on a 40-plus day journey with others and bring these gifts that we're going to see. These men certainly weren't uh, the smartest men in the world, but they were learned men. But the point is, is that these very learned, uh, wealthy, uh, semi-important men are now on their knees before a toddler, probably a year and a half old baby Jesus, uh, in this obscure town in Bethlehem. Uh, To worship, to really worship, is to employ humility. Second, we can see from the story, to worship is to offer gifts or sacrifice. This is probably the most obvious and probably the most well-known about uh, the wise men. I'd imagine if you ask a lot of people, hey, what do the wise men bring? Uh, Even people who maybe aren't real familiar with the Christmas story might get one or several of these gifts. Uh, We know they brought him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, for millennia, uh, gold was the metal of kings because it's beautiful, it's rare, it's expensive, right? Uh, gold was valuable. In fact, in Second Chronicles, I still can't get over this verse. Gold was so plentiful in the reign of Solomon that Scripture says silver was nothing. Okay, I'm not sure about you guys, but I'd love to have some silver. <laughs> that would be great. But gold was so plentiful, silver was nothing. But the point is, gold was valuable. It's a gift fit for a king. They gave uh, Christ gold. They also gave him frankincense. If you're not familiar with frankincense, uh, welcome to the club. I wasn't either. I always forget about it till this time of year. But it's a fragrant gum that's basically taken from the bark of really rare trees. It's a laborious task to get it out. So because it's so difficult to get kind of increases the value, if you will, of it. It's also worth noting that frankincense is the only incense mentioned in Exodus 30 that was permissible to burn on the altar um, when the Jews were worshiping God in the Old Testament, the only one. You can read about that in Exodus 30 if you like. Um, And then there's myrrh. Myrrh was basically a valuable spice, a perfume, and it's been estimated that one bottle of myrrh in today's standard, $10,000. That's a pretty significant gift, isn't it? $10,000 for one bottle of perfume. The point is, is that these men brought Jesus the best gifts they could find. And in fact, if you look at verse 11, it says they opened their treasures to give to Jesus. Uh, As a kid of the 80s, I was exposed to Barbara Robinson's The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. I don't know if you've ever read the story or seen any of the, the plays, but it basically tells a story in a small town where there's a family and this a woman kind of gets uh, voluntold, I guess is the word, to do the Christmas pageant because somebody else can't do it. And so she's assigning all the kids the part, who's going to be what. And there's this group of kids that just a really bad family. The, the dad is left. The mom is doing the best she can. She's a single mom working all the time. Uh, six kids, and there's just no other way to describe this. They're just, they're naughty kids. You know, they're, they're lacking discipline and structure. But they come and want to be part of the play, and they just basically take over. So they get all the main parts and all that. And the whole story is both comical and sad at the same time. But at the end of the story, you get a little glimpse of gospel hope. And what I mean by that is 
the three brothers are supposed to be the three wise men in the play, and they're supposed to at this time come up and give their gifts to baby Jesus. Well, only two of them actually show up for the play. And so, of course, everyone's worrying, where's the, where's the third brother at? What's going on? Is it gonna, what's going to happen? And then right before they walk out, the third brother comes in, and he's not carrying the little package of gold or myrrh, whatever he's supposed to be carrying. He's actually carrying a ham. And I know that sounds silly to say at first, a ham. Why would he give Jesus a ham? Well, they got a basket from the community, if you will, kind of a basket of goodies, uh, some fruit, some vegetables, some other things, and a Christmas ham. And so in his child's mind, he understood at that point, I'm supposed to give my best to this Christ child. And so he literally lays the ham at the feet of the Christ child, the the baby in the story. Uh, When they leave that night, For once, they are very selfless. Uh, They don't take any cookies. They don't don't take any of the goodies that people had brought to kids participate. Uh, They simply leave. But the point is, he understood that to worship really is to give sacrifices uh, or gifts. You know, we traditionally say that there were three wise men because of the three gifts. The truth is, we don't know how many. We just know it was plural, that it was more uh, than one. We also know, if you keep reading Matthew 2, that Herod intended to killed the Christ, Christ child, and sadly killed all the children that were male children that were two years and younger. Uh, the point is we see God's providence at work, and what I mean by that is these gifts were very valuable, and most likely it's what Joseph used to finance the journey to get he and Mary and Jesus down to Egypt when he was warned to do so. But sacrificial giving, the giving of gifts, this is um, the heart of worship. And then one last observation about worship. To worship is to obey in faith. If you look at verse 12, you see kind of the aftermath. So these men go, uh, they visit with Jesus, they offer his family uh, these gifts, and then they begin the journey back home. Verse 12 says that they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, but to depart their own country another way. We don't know if Jesus, or excuse me, if God sent an angel like he did with Joseph. I think it's kind of implied that he did, but what's important is God gave him a warning. He said, listen, don't go back this way, which means they now faced a choice. Will we obey God or will we obey this king? And remember that this particular king was not exactly the most stable king. Uh, He was very kind of emotionally reactive, if you will, uh, prone to anger, as we've seen in other cases. And so by disobeying this king, they were risking wrath. They were risking their very lives. Um, But the worship of God was more important to them, obviously, than the worship of men, which means you and I sometimes have a choice to make as well. Will we obey kings? Will we obey parliament or queens or senators or any other authority figures? Or will we obey the God who gives all authority their authority? Um, Will we obey kings or will we obey the king of kings? A scripture certainly tells us in Romans 13 to obey the laws of the land, and that is absolutely true. But scripture also tells us in Acts that we have a duty to disobey the law of the land if it goes against God's uh, law. And I feel like right now you might be thinking, this feels like you're contradicting yourself, Pastor. One minute you just told us that to worship is to give sacrificial gifts, and now I'm about to say, read something that sounds different. Psalm 51. If you have scripture, I invite you to turn there. Psalm 51, verse 16. We looked at this last week, the story of David and Bathsheba. David, of course, had sinned. This was his great psalm of penance or repentance, if you will. And in verse 16 of Psalm 51, uh, David is praying or talking to God, and he says this. Uh, For you, God, will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So was David saying we don't give gifts to God that we're not supposed to? No, he's saying I understand now it doesn't matter how many sacrifices I give to God. If he doesn't have my heart, the sacrifices are irrelevant. The gifts are irrelevant. The heart has to be right is the point that he is making. You know, uh, these uh, wise men sought out Jesus as they read the scriptures and they followed the star. Uh, Today, Jesus continues to call people to himself. Uh, He calls people to seek him out. We don't follow a star today, obviously, but we do follow a sign, and that's the scripture, the Bible. Scripture is full of verses that challenge uh, you and I to seek out Christ for one clear purpose, the forgiveness of our sins. 
You know, I don't know if you've ever read the Gospel of Mark, but Mark, verse 1, 15, the very first recorded words that Jesus says, according to Mark, is simply this. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the message that the world is desperate for. This is the message that uh, Western Carolina needs. This is the message that Smoky Mountain High School and Fairview Elementary, this is the message that our small town shops desperately need. This is the message that you and I need. We don't simply need to scour the news daily to read that a vaccine is now available for COVID. Uh, That would be wonderful to hear. We don't only need to hear that the problem of racism and social justice has been solved and we can all move on living peacefully and everyone can enjoy uh, both peace and justice together. That would be wonderful. And I don't mean to sound like I'm downing any of that stuff. It would be a delight to hear that. But it doesn't change the fact that the human problem is the same that it's always been, our sin problem. What are sinful people supposed to do before a holy God? According to Jesus Christ, repent and believe the gospel. I mentioned beginning the treasure hunts that my father prepared for my brother and I. And as I've gotten older, I've come to realize that the real treasure in these hunts uh, really was my father. And it was the love that he had for his boys. Uh, Through these hunts, he communicated sacrificial love to us. How much more does the Heavenly Father communicate his love to sinners by sending Christ for us? You know, today's account is a wonderful reminder that These men, these pagan Gentile stargazers, to use that language, really did not so much as seek out God as God really called them to himself. Uh, God is a gracious God who allows sinners like these wise men, sinners like you and me, to come to him. And so we need to remember as we move uh, forward in this year that wise men sought Jesus. It reminds me of Proverbs 3, again, familiar text that probably many of you are familiar with. Proverbs 3, beginning of verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your knowledge of the stars. I'm thinking about the wise men for a second. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your sh- straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil, like a selfish king who intends to harm this child. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Wise men sought Jesus. Wise men, wise women, wise children, seek him still. Pray that this year finds us and our families seeking the Christ. Father, we do thank you for this account of the wise men. And in some ways, we may not be able to relate, uh, Father, because of their wealth, because of their knowledge, because of their culture, because of their understanding of things that maybe we are not familiar with. But what we do understand, Lord, is that you were calling them to yourself. Father, they were wise to seek out the Lord Jesus. Anyone today who seeks you out is wise as well. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to do just that. Father, we pray particularly for those difficult times um, when the journey is long, when the journey is dark. Uh, Father, when we are questioning the decisions that we've made or we just don't understand why you would allow something to happen. Father, help us to keep our focus on the star, meaning the light, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand together as we conclude our worship. Uh, We'll sing, I believe it's God rest you, merry gentlemen. But please stand as Abby leads us. Good Christian
glad that you could join us for worship this morning. I would certainly invite you as you leave. Obviously, please uh, monitor social distancing. With that said, uh, please love on each other. Ask how you can be um, praying for the person. Let them know how they can be praying for you. As you go to the week the Lord has called you to, I offer his blessing to you in his name. Uh, The Lord of wisdom, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.